Good day, Thomas Jefferson Hour podcast listeners. And as always, thank you so much for listening. We really appreciate it. This week, we've got a good one for you. Lindsay Chervinsky is back, and the subject is Crossing the Delaware. Crossing the Delaware, both the famous painting by Emanuel Lutze, who was German and who painted it, by the way, in Dusseldorf. Uh, the first one perished in a 1942 air raid uh, over Germany by the Allied Air Forces. But there was a second one that he had done in 1851. That's the one that wound up in the United States and is now a magnificent 21 by 12 foot epic painting in New York City. You know, here's what I found so remarkable today. First of all, I love this 10 thing series with Lindsay Chervinsky. She's, she's funny. But here's what I find so interesting. It's you, my friend. You do your research. You, you knew things that neither one of us knew. You quoted some letters that I've never seen quoted before. You ask extraordinary questions. Well, well, really, really, you know, and I say this in the show, it's that book that uh, Rick Atkinson wrote. He's writing a trilogy on the American Revolution, and the first volume is out, and it's called The British Are Coming. And if you just read uh, the, the one chapter about crossing the Delaware, everything changes. Everything changed for me. Um, you know, we have... You know, like I was, you guys got hung up on the painting quite a bit, and I understand that, but that's kind of like uh, a caricature of history that everybody has sort of accepted and goes, wow, and they should. But the reality of it is so much more amazing. Um, when you start reading about what the soldiers actually did and how none of it worked, but it all worked, it's, it's an amazing story. It's great. Anyway, since Lindsay has joined the ranks here, we get a lot of mail about about her and a lot of suggestions about uh, this 10 Things series that uh, that I'm sure the two of you will plot and scheme and get get onto the calendar, right? That we certainly will, and we do want feedback on this series and also on the one-on-one -on -one series. As you know, David, sometimes I need to interview someone that you're not available for, and then we fold it into the program. We call this the one-on-one -on -one series that I'm also right. doing for the Listening to America initiative at governing.com, where people can read my interviews. We, and, and by the way, I'm feeling it. It's time for a Joseph Ellis return to this program. Yep. So, But but yep. we, we got to have Joe back on because I've missed him, and there are things I want to ask him. So now we have the Lindsay Chervinsky series, 10 Things. If you like this program, let us know. Tell us what things we can do to improve, correct us if we make errors, make suggestions about 10 things or any other topic you'd like us to discuss, and we take criticism. We should wrap and go to the show. So if you got anything you want to pitch, now's your time. Oh, my. So th there's still a little time to get in on the uh, Water in the West online course. It's exciting. We're going to be talking about all sorts of things. I had the chance to interview Char Miller of Pomona College about this the other day. He's one of the greatest intellectuals in the country. And also, uh, I interviewed um, James Lawrence Powell, who wrote Deadpool, the book about um, Lake Powell that you know we're probably never going to be able to refill it, given the overallocation of those waters and the and the now uh, significant distortions of global climate change. And so, water in the West is coming. The summer trips are full. Next year's winter encampments are going to be two: one on Lewis and Clark returning in 1806, and the other one will be on two novels by Dostoevsky. The Brothers Karamazov and Crime and Punishment. So if you're interested in those, be watching for them on the Jefferson Hour site. They're coming up in January of 2023. We're also going to France this fall. People can still sign up for the second of our Jefferson and France tours. And we will be going to Greece in the year 2024. So lots and lots are coming up. And people can buy my book, The Language of Cottonwoods, Essays on the Future of North Dakota. It's been getting some really nice response, David. And so it's just a wonderful, productive, satisfying time. And I just so appreciate our our main guests, Joseph Ellis, Lindsay Chervinsky, and then those people um, who appear on the one-on-one. -on -one the series. long, long list of contributors. All right, that's enough. Let's go to the show. Thanks. Good day, citizens, and welcome to the Thomas Jefferson Hour. Today, our 10 Things series. We're so pleased to be joined by Lindsay Chervinsky and the creator of the Thomas Jefferson Hour, Mr. Clay Jenkins, and I'm your host, David Swenson. And the two of you, I am so excited to hear you speak about this week's subject, 
The Crossing of the Delaware, which is something I've read about and really enjoyed learning about. Maybe just to set it up, we could say that the Continental Army was in a state of disarray in the winter of 1776. The Army had had a small victory in Boston in March, but it was followed by a series of defeats. The state of New York was lost to the British, and Washington and his army fled to New Jersey and then into Pennsylvania. They camped on the Delaware. Sickness and a severe lack of supplies and clothing, a loss of nearly 90% of its battle strength, and dwindling public support led Washington to write to his brother Samuel, quote, I think the game is pretty near up. But Washington believed if he could achieve even a small victory, their fortunes could change. And this led to the plan to cross the Delaware the night of Christmas 1776 and attack the village of Trenton. Do I have it about right? Yeah, I think that's a great background summary of where we are. And you really can't understand the story, whether it be the painting or the actual crossing, without that context, because things were really, really, really bad in 1776 at the end of the year. And you know, Washington had lost most of his troops. The states were sort of threatening to not re-up, to not send more funds, to not send more militia. And so it just really was an extremely dire moment. And that it's easy for us to know from 2022 how it all turned out and, you know, how they had this success. But it's really important that we, you know, take away that present context and think about what they were feeling at that moment and how dark it actually was. And there are three things that really strike me about this, Lindsay. One is that, because um, that led to its, its sort of centrality in American memory. Number one, it was a Christmas night crossing. So there's Christmas, and that gives it uh, some of its appeal. If it had been August, it would have been a different sort of story. So not only winter, but Christmas, that's daring and maybe unexpected because it's Christmas. Uh, secondly, um, this was a, maybe the darkest period of the war so far, at least. And so we needed a really important symbolic pick-me-up of, of, of one type or another. This gave us that it immediately became something that was um, well-known and, and perked up the esprit de corps of, of the American cause. And third, it led to a monumental painting by Emanuel Lutze, which is in New York. I've seen it. You've seen it. It's one of the most extraordinary paintings in America, partly because of its its monumental size. It's 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 a it's a almost a, a room-sized painting, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And and not only is it this incredible painting that has become this cultural touchstone for the American people, but it has spawned an incredible series of sort of replicas with, you know, interesting other, yeah. And so like at one point there have been a series of ones that were about women talking about suffrage and so they're just such cool elements. And if you didn't have the cultural piece that pretty much everyone knows what this painting is to start with, you can't have those replicas that actually work if you don't all have that set knowledge to begin with. Yeah, the Simpsons appear in one and other characters. I mean, it's been widely parodied for all sorts of purposes, but it's iconic. It, it's one of those paintings that has uh, blown beyond its importance as a piece of art to a piece of, of, of national memory. And, and I remember seeing it, I think it's 12 by 21 feet. So that is huge. And when you walk into that room in the museum in New York, you almost step backwards because it overwhelms you with its epic nature. So those three things, Christmas, um, the really desperate condition of, of the American cause at the time, and uh, this memorial painting, which, by the way, is the second in the series. The first one uh, was damaged by fire in 1851 in Germany, and it was later destroyed by a bombing mission in 1942 over Germany. So this is uh, the uh, a second version that Lutze uh, created. Well, I think that was one of the things on our list. So maybe let's let's start there. That can be our number one. Yeah, what, what's amazing about this story, and I'm so glad you brought this to my attention because I didn't actually know this backstory. It's destroyed at this moment when the United States is in a all-out battle for the future of democracy globally. And FDR really pitched World War II as a global struggle for the preservation of democracy. It was either democracy or it was fascism. And this painting that represents one of the most famous moments in, you know, the American Revolution, which we as Americans hold so dear to our hearts, 
is actually in Germany and American forces sort of inadvertently destroy it. And so it's just, it's such a unique twist of fate. It wasn't painted for us. It was painted that our inspiration would somehow seed the revolutionary movements in Europe. There were widespread revolutions in Europe in 1848. Um, There are books about this. Almost every uh, European country had some sort of a revolution in 1848. Many of them were not successful. And Lutze painted it for the Europeans to take heart from this symbolic moment uh, in American history. So it wasn't painted for America. It was painted for a European audience. It wound up here. The second version of it wound up here. But you're so right. The irony of the war to save freedom, um, you know, Roosevelt is famous for his four freedom speech. And in that war, we inadvertently destroy version one of this great painting. Luckily, there's version two, and we have it. Number two on your list was the who's who of the revolution that were present at this crossing. And you know, it was Washington, Monroe, Thomas Mifflin, William Bradford, Henry Knox, Alexander Hamilton, Arthur St. Clair, Joseph Reed, Charles Wilson Peel, Benjamin Rust, uh, Nathaniel Green, and of course, Cornwallis on the British side. Uh, Just quickly, they weren't all in the boat. So Lindsay, they were all there. Yes, that's right. So a, a little bit of military backstory in this. There were actually supposed to be three separate crossings. They were supposed to cross at different places. Some of the crossings didn't actually work out because of the way the river moves and the ice flow, and it was simply too dangerous for some of the other crossings to take place. They ended up crossing later and meeting up with Washington. But so many of these figures, when they thought about the war and they thought about sacrifice and they thought about what it meant to be in the military and in the revolution, they could think of this moment as a touchstone for them. And it really was a an emotional calling point for the soldiers that had been present. And so I think it's just so valuable to think about all the people, all the names we know, and to be able to kind of figure out where they were in this configuration and you know, I think we're gonna we're gonna get into this, but the conditions were terrible. They were horrible that night. And you know, I was reading about this, and then went for a walk with my dog, and it was kind of cold out. And I was like, I really can't complain about how cold it is. I'm wearing a down coat. I'm fine. So you know, I think it's just uh, it's great to think about all these people being there and what that meant to them later on. Just again, Washington, of course, James Monroe, who later became Jefferson's protege and the fifth president of the United States, Thomas Mifflin, William Bradford, Henry Knox, uh, after whom Fort Knox and and Washington's um, uh, uh, war uh, department leader, the great Alexander Hamilton, Arthur St. Clair, Joseph Reed, the painter and museum director, Charles Wilson Peale, the medical genius of Philadelphia and the savior of Philadelphia in the 1793 yellow fever epidemic, Benjamin Rush. Oh, we're going to have to do an episode of Benjamin Rush if that's how you're portraying him in You're not going to attack him. You will not not attack Benjamin Rush. Okay, how about this? Here's the deal. Next time you're sick, let's apply his medical solutions to your sickness, and then we'll see how you feel about Benjamin Rush. Yeah, next time you're sick and dying and no one will come to your house and Benjamin (laughs) Rush comes to your house because nobody else will come to treat you, then go ahead and condemn him. But let's leave that for now. I can't believe that you would go out. I didn't even get to finish my list. I'm trying to finish this neutral little list, and then you go after Benjamin Rush. Nathaniel Green. Okay, so clearly he's on the list, but I realize I also forgot a name on this list, which I'm pretty sure Thomas Paine was also there. Paine was there? I think so. He may have left. Okay, so I know he was with the Army up until early December. I don't know exactly when he left. It was a a who's who of the American cause were were not in this painting, but in this moment. And so, David, can I just want to jump? I I don't know what question this is, but can I jump to this one? So let's call it number three. Whose idea was this, Lindsay? Who who cooked up this scheme? Well, I think it was a multi-prong effort. There was certainly Washington was convinced by early December that some sort of action was required. A, A large number of troops their enlistments had expired actually on December 1st, some of the Maryland line, and I think some of the Pennsylvania line as well. Maybe it was New Jersey. And they had gone home. So in you know just a couple of weeks, he had lost thousands and thousands of troops. And so, and he knew that he was going to lose a num- an, another several thousand at the very end of the month. And so 
there was a conviction, I think a shared conviction among the officer corps that something had to be done. And um, Washington put Henry Knox, who was the general of artillery in charge of planning this crossing. And there's a line, I, I love this, this quote so much. So, you know, we often, when we think about Henry Knox, we think about the portrait of him being rather rotund, he was, but he was also a taller man. So he was just like a very physically imposing person. He had already proven his bravery with the um, mission to bring down the cannons from Fort Ticonderoga. He had been with Washington since the very beginning of the war, was very well liked. But apparently he had this like very booming, huge voice, which we don't usually get in our stories about him. And several of the commanders later said that the crossing would have failed but for the stentorian lungs of Colonel Knox, because I, you know, I mentioned the terrible conditions. It was a nor'easter. It was a blizzard, and there were winds and sleet and snow. And somehow Knox had to oversee all of the crossing of the infantry, the horses, the artillery, and that is a huge feat. So we don't know absolutely whose idea it was. It kind of has the ring of Hamilton. It doesn't really sound like George Washington to me. I think that might be a little bit of the later George Washington coming into play because he constantly wanted to take on these grandiose battle plans. In fact, when he first took over command of the Continental Army, he wanted to attack the British in Boston and his officers had to be like, no, that's a really terrible idea. And at one point he even came up with a cockamamie scheme to have the soldiers fitted with ice skates once the bay had frozen over and to basically go across the ice. And again, his officers were like, that's just a terrible motion. We need to take a short break from this conversation about crossing the Delaware, but we'll return to it in just a moment. You're listening to The Thomas Jefferson Hour. Welcome back to the Thomas Jefferson Hour this week with Clay Jenkinson and Lindsay Trevinsky discussing crossing the Delaware. I'm going to go to number four on your list, if I might, and that is we need to talk about the boats. And I agree. My understanding is most of the boats that were used were called Durham boats, shallow draft, strongly built. By 11 o'clock that night, they had winds that were akin to hurricane force. And the temperature was somewhere between 29 and 33 degrees. Um, so it was a miserable night. But where they crossed, it was only about 300 yards. There were a couple of different kinds of boats that were used. Um, many of them were Durham boats, but there were actually two different Durham boats that were, were employed. There was a Durham iron manufacturer nearby. And so they had ferries that they used to transport their machinery and equipment and then the finished iron product across the river. And these were the type of ferries that were so heavy duty that they could afford to carry things like cannons and artillery and the horses and could hold that sort of weight. And those were more of the flat bottom ferry type of things that you might imagine. Then there was a separate type of Durham boat, and it looks a little bit more like a really large, a really large canoe almost. And these were excellent for carrying the infantry. Now, there's some discrepancy about how they would have been transferred. Certainly, they were not riding across the river as depicted in the image of, you know, sort of very much on display, very gallant, very artistic. But I've read a fair number of arguments that actually suggest that they would not have been sitting or kneeling because the conditions of the river that night, the conditions, the weather, and the way these boats were built, they would have had a lot of ice and sludge at the bottom of the boat. And so you really don't actually want to be sitting in icy, sludgy water. Um, that would have been extremely uncomfortable. And so maybe a crouch would have been more appropriate, but definitely not seated because there were not seats and the, the base of the ship would have been covered. I'm looking at the painting as we talk, and I urge our listeners to pull it up on their device if they can, or to look at it later. Uh, a couple of things, Lindsay. One is that I see at least six and maybe as many as seven boats, and the ones in the painting look pretty similar, although it's pretty hard to see the ones that are off in the distance. On the one behind 
uh, the main boat. There are horses. I see at least three horses, and they're not happy. I can tell you that. They're having a hard time <laughs> keeping them calm on that boat. Um, there are 12 people in the main boat, and George Washington, so far from sitting or crouching, is not holding on to anything, which I doubt. I think if I were in that boat, I'd be, I'd find something to grip, no matter where I was sitting or standing. Um, and the and I've read, and and you tell me if I'm wrong, that that the the basis for the painting was actually the River Rhine, and these look like icebergs, whereas that wouldn't have been the nature of the ice on the Delaware that night. And so there are some historical uh, distortions or inaccuracies to it. But I'm looking at the number of ships, and I had never seen that before as you look behind the flag and then on the one most closest there are these three really upset horses and so i don't know how many people were ferried across uh, that night do you know lindsay i think washington had like six thousand troops if i am remembering my reading correctly now i don't think all of them were battle ready so i think maybe it was closer to like 3,000. Let's say it's 3,000. That's a lot of taxiing. Yeah. You know, if there are 12 people in the main boat, there are probably more in some of the others, but there must have been repeated crossings. Yeah. The ships that I am seeing, you can actually Google these Durham boats. They would have held many more people if it was just infantry because they would have been, because there were no places to sit, like pictured in the the portrait or the, the painting, they would have mostly been standing. They would have been closely huddled together. So while my spatial awareness is not fantastic, I'm willing to bet that it was more like 30 to 50 men per ship, if I had to, per boat, if I had to guess. Then in particular in the painting, the horses are quite problematic because you don't want horses to be able to jump off a boat that easily. And <laughs> the boat that they're pictured in is incredibly low to the water. So that would have, they would have had a much higher side boat to be able to sort of keep them in place. There's no doubt that they would have been unhappy about it though, because it was a pretty unpleasant experience for anyone involved. Yeah, snow and sleet. One soldier wrote in his diary that it, quote, blew a perfect hurricane. But one thing that did work in Washington's favor was this large number of experienced watermen provided by Colonel John Glover's Marblehead Regiment. Um, and these guys were readily identifiable because they wore these short blue coats, tarred pants, and woolen caps. But those were the guys who really provided the skill needed to make sure it was a, a successful crossing. Yeah, the, the Marblehead seamen actually had proven to be quite important at several different moments in 1776 when Washington famously orders the retreat off of Long Island onto Manhattan in the middle of the night and sort of escapes with the fog when the British have surrounded them. The people who were in charge of making sure those, you know, floats and ships and whatever was available actually crossed the harbor were these experienced men from, you know, sea seafaring towns. And that actually posed one of the challenges because they didn't, they really wanted to actually go back to Massachusetts because they wanted to go set up privateers to attack the British because they felt that would be a more lucrative way to spend the war. And they were right. So Washington was basically pleading with them to stay through this campaign because they were the ones that would have the success knowing how to get across the river. Earlier, you talked about how there were plans for three separate river crossings, but in fact, only one of them made it across. There was a Colonel Cad Wallader who was supposed to lead a force of about 1,800 men uh, across the river near Burlington, and then a General James Ewing's force of about 800 Pennsylvania militia, and they were supposed to cross the river at Trenton, but neither one of them made it. Yeah, that's right. So the way the river works, there was a, a small falls that was just below Trenton. And because of the ice, the ice was pooling at the base of the falls. Now, Clay is right that it wouldn't have looked like these icebergs, but there was still, nonetheless, there was ice and the currents made it particularly unsafe to try and get across. So there were, you know, some real geographic challenges to the plan. Which, of course, delayed everything by hours and so as soon as Washington's plan went into effect, it was really uh, already a mess. 
you, know, you read about this and it's like, it's like a movie. I mean, I, I, it's hard to believe that it, it succeeded. There was so much working against them. Yeah, I think this is one of those moments where it could have, I mean, Washington had a real sense that he was protected by providence or fate and was sort of destined for uh, bigger and better things. And when you read about the retreats from New York and then you read about this moment, it's hard not to agree with him because so much could have gone wrong. And uh, as you said, they were extremely delayed in their crossing. They were delayed uh, once they got to the other side of the shore. And yet, and I know I'm sort of skipping ahead here. I don't know what number one. I've completely forgotten. But not a single soldier and not a single piece of artillery was lost in these crossings. The odds of that happening are kind of like preposterously astronomical. And yet the fact that they all get across to the other side, we know that it goes on to be this amazing surprise. It's one of those moments where you kind of can't help feel like, yeah, maybe he was right. Maybe there is an element of providential design in this plan. Oh, come on. I'm a real fan of Rick Atkinson. Um, he's a great military historian. And he's uh, he's finished, recently has finished his first volume on uh, a trilogy about the Revolutionary War. And he writes about this. And um, there, were, there were squabbles because some of the commanders said, no, it's too bad, we can't go across. And, and soldiers were going to revolt and just go on their own. One of the crossings, they got halfway across and it was just like sheets of block ice and soldiers jumped out of the boats and balanced on the ice flows until they hit the, the next shore. It's just, it's like a movie. It really is. It's a great subject. Um, you, you, you just did number five, Lindsay, about no single man or single piece of artillery or man was lost to the river, which is amazing. And then we go on to number six, which was after the crossing, the soldiers began to march at 4 a.m. The weather continued to get worse, and the terrain was dangerous. They had to complete this march uh, while trying to maintain surprise under terrible conditions without sleep. Some of these guys didn't really have proper shoes. No, they didn't. I, and I, you know, forgive me if I'm being repetitive with this, but it's so important that we don't, even though this has become a romantic moment in the revolution that we don't actually romanticize what the experience would have been like because most of the infantry did not have proper equipment or clothing. It was freezing. It was sleet. So they were soaking wet. They did have fires once they first got across the river while they were waiting, waiting for the rest of the supplies and the troops to arrive. But the minute they left the fireside, they then again were wet and cold and they, the terrain, the march from the river to Trenton was hilly. There were ravines. It was quite dangerous. And they had to march several miles after having no sleep and after completing this march. And so I just wanted to pause again and take a moment about the, you know, war is terrible and brutish, but it's especially terrible and brutish when you don't have shoes in the snow. And so I just think that's it's worth highlighting the physical endurance and the sacrifices that were made to actually make this moment possible. Let me go to number seven. I'm putting seven in a little early here, David. Who were these Hessians and why were there Hessians and how many were there? And, and you know, we always hear about the mercenaries and the, the Hessians. What exactly does that signify in this war of independence, Lindsay? It's a great point. So the... British imperial system tended to funnel its forces, men, manpower, firepower, et cetera, et cetera, into the Navy. Understandably, it's an island nation, and the British people were fairly distrusting of a standing army based on many centuries of warfare. And so many of the kings had come up with this solution where if they needed more manpower, if they needed more troops for a battle, they would just hire them out. And many of the small empires in middle and, and uh, in the middle of Europe, like places like Austria and what we would now think of as Hungary, and there was a you know a Hessian Empire, they would hire out troops from these regions. It was a very lucrative endeavor for these local rulers. It gave a lot of men with no jobs something to do and a way to make money. So it was 
a good proposition because anyone knows you don't want to have large populations of young men unemployed causing a ruckus. So being able to send them somewhere is generally a good idea. But this was also a deeply unpopular aspect of the war for Americans because Americans felt like the king was hiring foreigners to come attack them. And this became a real a real battle cry during the revolution, a real element of the charges against the king is that he wasn't dealing with this sort of internally. It wasn't an interfamily squabble. He was hiring these hardened battle veterans who had been accused of atrocities to come and, you know, crush the the rebels, and it was going to lead to pillaging and rape and all of these horrible things in in the colonies. And to a certain extent, some of those fears did play out. Now, any war, any army does bad things. There's there's no monopoly on wrongdoing. But there had been, up until this moment, there had been pretty widespread accusations against the Hessians and the Brit- British troops in particular in New Jersey. So there were well-publicized accusations of rape, and that was something that certainly was on the minds of these soldiers as they were heading towards Trenton. And let me just read from the master, Thomas Jefferson's Declaration of Independence, his list of the crimes of George III and the ministry of Great Britain. He says, he is at this time transporting large armies of foreign mercenaries to complete the works of death, desolation, and tyranny already begun with circumstances of cruelty and perfidy, scarcely paralleled in the most barbarous ages and totally unworthy of the head of a civilized nation. So there's Jefferson's propaganda about the Hessians. And as you know, Lindsay, Jefferson kind of wasn't in the war. Uh, His big concern were two. One is that there were Hessian prisoners in Albemarle County, and he had them over for dinner, and they were playing music, and they became friends, and they were talking about violins, and they were leaving him sheet music, and he was just treating these people like European members of the of the Enlightenment. Uh, but secondly, he was mostly concerned about the Hessian fly. The, the Apparently a fly or some sort of a parasite came over, theoretically, with the Hessian troops and was ravaging the wheat um, yields in the United States. And so when Jefferson and Madison went on their famous botanizing tour of New England, part of their reason, part of their cover story was that they were trying to investigate um, the... Um, the destruction uh, of our wheat crop by the Hessian fly. So that doesn't put Jefferson in the best possible light. (laughs) No, not particularly. And, you know, I mean, as I said, all, whenever you have a body of armed forces, there's going to be bad behavior. That's just kind of the nature of warfare. So it's not like Hessian troops were more brutal per se than any other forces. It's still mercenaries. But they were a very... That's got to bother you, right? Well, they certainly, I mean, they were literally the definition of mercenaries. So that certainly led, and and they didn't have an emotional, you know, horse in the fight, which I do think contributed to to some of this concern. But because they didn't have an emotional horse in the fight, they were also much more willing to sort of, um, they're much more willing to surrender because they didn't care. They were only there for the money and they still got paid even if they were prisoners of war. Especially if they got dinner with Mr. Jefferson. In the battle, uh, the U.S. <laughs> troops killed 22, wounded 98, and captured 1,000. Killed 22, wounded 98, captured 1,000. And um, best estimates that their colonial losses were fewer than 10 dead. So an amazing uh, victory with very, uh, I'm sure some people got pneumonia and, uh, and, and were really chilled by this. But in terms of death, uh, under a dozen Americans killed. Yeah, it was one of those moments where, you know, Washington and the Continental Army had several moments throughout the war where even if the numbers were sort of equal, they could claim a moral victory or an emotional victory or a strategic victory. But this is one of the few cases where in under any measure, they were victorious. And certainly the emotional boost came at a time which was so valuable. But they also, you know, captured all these people. And it was a real embarrassment as well to Cornwallis. So that was a, an essential essential turning point. And the Hessians were harassed. I think that's something that that um, maybe doesn't come out in these discussions forever, but they were. Uh, 
There's there's diaries of Hessians writing home saying they haven't been able to sleep one night since they came to Trenton. Um, the Americans would blacken their faces and sneak across the river and snipe at German outposts. Um, and so there, were, there was a lot going on prior to this crossing, too. I mean, you get the impression the, Amar- the American troops were a pretty sparky bunch in spite of the conditions they were living in. I think it was just so appalling to the Americans that the British had brought in foreign troops. The idea that this is a this is a dispute between the home country and the in the colonial um, country. Uh, it's it's a dispute about the rights of, of of British citizens, about the British Constitution, about the colonial um, subservience of America, and suddenly the British don't just fight this battle on their own. They bring in thousands of foreigners. Um, this was appalling to people like Jefferson and to the Americans, and I think they had a special vitriol against the Hessians that they didn't necessarily have against the British troops. We need to take a short break from this conversation, but we'll return in just a moment. You're listening to The Thomas Jefferson Hour. Welcome back to this special edition of the Thomas Jefferson Hour with our friend, Dr. Lindsay Chervinsky, talking about 10 things, this time 10 things about the crossing of the Delaware, both the famous painting, which now resides in New York, and of course the event itself. And we are on some concern amongst us about whether Thomas Paine was there and if so, what his role was. Those are things that remain a little bit uncertain in the historical record, but man, it was a who's who of the American cause at the time, just so we don't run out of time, Lindsay, let me ask you about who's in that boat. So there are 12 people in the boat. It's fascinating. Who can we identify, or more to the point, what varieties of American patriots can we identify in this famous painting? So we can tell based on um, some of the sartorial choices that we have different troops from different parts of the colonial project. There is what looks like a raccoon tail or perhaps a fox tail hat that would have had, so it would have had fur around the brim that was usually more of a Western region. So we certainly have some Westerners represented. There's a gentleman in the middle of the boat, which looks like he has maybe a sort of an oil skin type of hat. Not clear what that means. He looks like he's a mariner, a professional mariner. Yeah, exactly. And then there would have been, there were also a couple of the tricorn hats, which are some of the more famous colonial hats that we think of as the traditional headwear. And just a couple of other things. In the back, in the far back, there is either a Native American or somebody dressed like a Native American. He's wearing a green blouse He has some sort of a fur cap on, and he has a kit bag, a kind of beaded, decorated, necessaries bag, and he's wearing moccasins. He's wearing moccasins, and he's the rudder at the back of the boat, you know, steering them through these ice flows. There's a man with Scots attire, so he's a Scottish-American, probably from the Trans-Appalachian region, you know, the Pennsylvania. Is he the guy that has the hat with the little red puff in the center? Yeah, he's the Scotsman. But even more interesting, Lindsay, there appears to be an African-American just to Washington's right. Um, He's also pulling, uh, but he clearly appears to be black. He's wearing a hat, and he has a red sash. Um, It it could be a shadow, but I think most art historians think that it was an African-American. That's fascinating. Well, and we know that there were African-American troops, both from... There were both people who had been enslaved and were offered their freedom and returned for service, as well as free African-Americans who genuinely believed in the cause. And this was something that Washington was initially reluctant about. Arming African-Americans was something that a Southerner was probably pretty uncomfortable with, but came to realize both that he needed the men, but also that Black Americans were capable of fighting with just as much valor and honor as white Americans. I think I might have said this before on a previous episode, but it bears repeating that I am a big believer that this experience of of commanding black Americans was one of the elements that started to shift his thinking on slavery. 
Indeed. So just a couple more things, David, and then we can go on to question eight. But there's a flag, and unfortunately, it's not accurate there. That's not a flag that existed at the time. In fact, that flag did not exist until June 14th, 1777. So we're about six months, five and a half months ahead of that flag design. And George Washington standing heroically, I mean, majestically um, in the boat with one foot up on the gunwale um, <laughs> is wearing, he's, he's got a cape on. Uh, he looks like a figure out of a Marvel comic, a hero. And he's looking very purposefully off at the shoreline. And one of the art critics that I read about this said, oh, come on, it didn't occur when it was light. But of course, <laughs> if he had painted it, as it was, we wouldn't get to see it, would we? It was dark. And so, um, of course, they're going to take some artistic license with the amount of light. But 12 people in the boat, two of them sort of huddled with the flag. And then you have at least four people rowing um, and one up in front pushing ice flows away from the front of the boat. And then in back, this Native American, probably, or someone dressed as a Native American, uh, serving as the rudder. And it looks like they're they're well above the water here. Um, it's a pretty amazing painting. There also are two men in what uh, one art historian called farmers hats. They're the kind of broad hats that a farmer from the western part of these states would have worn. So in a sense, it's a meant to be a multicultural picture of America. No women, of course, in this uh, instance, but a whole range of different geographies, regions and even races here. Well, and in that sense, that is actually an accurate representation of the status of the Continental Army at this time. I mean, to be sure, there would have been a series of different clothing types. There there was a designated uniform, but most people either it had been destroyed through too much use or they couldn't afford one. So there tended to be a supplementation based on whatever people had or they brought with them. We do know that the army was filled with all different types of races and ethnicities. There were, of course, a lot of women present because they tended to do the cooking and the cleaning for the camp, as well as provide uh, some of the home comforts that men were accustomed to. Um, yes, I'm saying that sarcastically. Uh, one one other quick note I just wanted to to mention about the um, the flag that would have been present. And there probably would have been a flag because it was an important part of sort of the army standard. It would have had the red and white stripes, but in the corner, it would have had what we think of now as the Union Jack. So the British version. So it was kind of a bastardization of the two different flags that we have come to know. David and Lindsay, when I went with my daughter in New York to, and, and came around a corner in the, in the art museum and saw this, uh, as I say, 12 by 21 feet. I, I gasped, and I was filled with a kind of moment of American patriotism. And as a historian, you're sort of taught to be a little skeptical about those things, but I was. I was swept up in it. And I just thought, first of all, hooray for the size of this thing. But this multicultural nature of it, the the boldness and the bravery of this overnight attack, there's just something about this that is extremely compelling. And you compare it, say, to Trumbull's painting in the rotunda of the U.S. Capitol of Jefferson handing in the Declaration of Independence. I don't feel that when I see that. But this one, I think, goes back to what you said about hardship, Lindsay. I mean, this was rough. This was winter. They could have drowned. They could have been swept over the falls. There could have been enormous losses. They could have gotten frostbite or hypothermia, or pneumonia. Uh, this is a dangerous crossing. It could easily have failed. And we know, remember, from the back at the French and Indian War, when Washington was out um, in the Ohio country near Pittsburgh, he fell from a raft into the water, and he got extremely chilled. Luckily then, he was just a, a very, very young man, and they were able to start fires and, and dry him out. But you could easily... Uh, be killed in an operation like this, and it could easily have gone terribly wrong. I think that the fact that it is such an incredibly bold attack, uh, when it was unlikely that we could pull off such a maneuver, uh, gives it some of its quality of exciting patriotic feelings. What do you think? Yeah, I think so. And it definitely has a little bit of a 
David and Goliath feel to it. The moment does. And that is something that, you know, Americans, we really like that David and Goliath concept. We like to think of ourselves as the scrappy underdog and the scrappy insurgency. And in 1776, we were. It's an accurate representation of the the fight and strength and the potential of the two sides. So it is it is while, you know, there are a lot of historical moments that we can't over glorify, this is one that is pretty remarkable. And David, you quoted Washington's letter when he thought it, it may we may be about to lose this. Yeah, writing to his brother Samuel. Um I, I, I agree with your, your both of your points about a, a, a turning point, you know, like great works of fiction, movies, books. There'll be a point where things turn. And, and to me, this, that is a point where things turn in this great saga of the formation of America. But, you know, as you said, Clay, as a historian, you, you know, you came around the corner and saw the painting and gasped. As a historian, you have to be a little bit, you know, you both spend a lot of time talking about the painting, but this is historically inaccurate, and you both have said so. You know, Washington wouldn't have stood. The flag was wrong. Uh, all these other things. Um, granted, it's maybe a conglomeration, but it's, a, you know, it's painted on the Rhine, not the Delaware. But both of you seem really taken by it in spite of the fact, as historians, you know it's completely historically inaccurate. So why is it that that it is so important? Well, it leads to a question that I have. But but first of all, let me say Washington may have been standing, but if he was, there were people holding on to his coat and making sure that he wasn't going to fall. You can't let your— everybody kind of had to stand, and they had high sides. He wouldn't have had his foot on the side, I think. He wouldn't (laughs) have been so (laughs) intentionally off balance. Let's—we can all agree to that. But it's a nice gesture, I think. It is. It's a very masculine stance. But let me ask a question before Lindsay answers why it is of this importance, because I've sort of given my answer. But, but, but it's one I just thought of, Lindsay. What do the American people know about this? We know about this. It looms large in our understanding of the war. Were there were there illustrations? Were there immediate accounts? Did this spread like wildfire through the the colonial system, and people were like, "Hey, we might win this war." What? How did it disseminate? Yeah, it was really widely shared. Washington was quite intentional and strategic about keeping Congress updated about what was going on. Some of that was a CYA maneuver when he was ordering a series of retreats, and he wanted to make sure that Congress knew that all of the officers agreed that retreat was essential, and these were unanimous decisions. But then when things went well, he would send very positive reports. And some of those reports were you know, printed, but then there were also letters printed in newspapers. There were people like Thomas Paine, who prior to this had been sharing updates in his, in the newspaper, he would send them. So there were people that were writing about these things. And then of course, there was the well-established practice of letter writing in which people would regularly share the letters they received with friends and family and neighbors. It was not uncommon to pass around letters or to read out loud letters. And this was spread, and intentionally so, because it was an emotional boost. And so it was designed that the spread of news, the spread of the story was designed to remind Americans why they were fighting, that they had a chance to win, that they should continue to invest in this process. So it was kind of an accurate reporting and also a massive propaganda effort, which is essential in any sort of battle and and warfare. The reason I think this moment does have that emotional appeal like some other ones don't, why it matters so much. This was a relatively small group of people who understood that as long as they survived and they continued to fight, the cause for independence would survive too. And it was often unglamorous, regularly was not particularly successful, but it was an eight-year commitment, and eight years is an extraordinary amount of time to be living through crisis. I mean, we've been living through a pandemic for two And I've spent most of the pandemic in my office in a very comfortable surrounding, and it's still not particularly fun. They spent eight years fighting a battle. And and a lot of the infantry did serve for the majority of the war because they didn't really necessarily have anywhere else to go. And so that story of a few giving so very much for this cause is one that it's hard not to feel, I think, a little bit emotional about. We only have a couple of points left, and we only have a few minutes left, Um, and most of these questions have sort of been wrapped into other answers, but there is one 
that, uh, Lindsay, I thought you would, would talk about perhaps, and that's uh, Washington almost losing his mount. We, we talked a little bit about the Providence that was, was you know, taking care of Washington. And um, that was especially important because he did not put himself out of harm's way. He was not the type of commander that was hanging back, staying in safe places. He regularly rode to the front of the line to try and encourage troops. He often had mounts shot out from underneath him. And uh, there, there are several times when he absolutely should have died because the British knew who he was and they would have tried to kill him if they could. But this moment is so interesting because, as as I said, the march was incredibly dangerous and the terrain was incredibly dangerous and there was no electricity, there were no road signs, there were no lights. So they had, you know, they did have torches and they had uh, lanterns. But at one point, and Washington was on horseback and was going up and down the line and talking to the soldiers and trying to encourage them and talking with his officers and his horse lost its footing and started to slip basically into a ravine. And Washington leaned forward by by the people, according to the people who were observing this, he leaned forward and he grabbed the horse's head and basically pulled the horse's head up and then shifted his weight such that the horse could regain its footing. And he was, by all accounts, an incredible horseman. But what I like about this story is that this is one of thousands that you can read in soldiers' accounts where they adore adored Washington. And the reason that they adored him is because they never felt like he was trying to avoid the hardship that they were enduring. He regularly was with them. He regularly talked to them. He was willing to take risks himself. So they felt that he had their back. And again, that's not to overglorify him or to say he was perfect. Lord knows he had flaws and, and made bad choices. But he showed remarkable bravery during the war and a remarkable commitment to his troops. And they loved him so much that at times Congress referred to the army as Washington's army because they knew without him it would completely fall apart. I should say something about the horse. Jefferson, who was a great horseman himself, said Washington was, quote, the greatest horseman of the age. He didn't say that lightly because these were all horsemen. And Jefferson was himself a great lover of horse. Um, and he worked his horses hard and spent money he didn't have to buy horses he couldn't afford and so on. But but also, it's something you said that's so important, Lindsay, about Washington's being there. During the Newburgh conspiracy, when the troops were maybe going to mutiny because they hadn't been paid at the end of the war and so on, uh, Washington said, I've never gone home. I've been with you from the, the entire time. I, I have never taken a leave. I've never gone back to Mount Vernon and regroup for the winter or whatever. I've been here the entire time. And I think that is just so incredibly important for this war. Yeah. I mean, he went to, he was at Mount Vernon for two nights and it was on the march from New York down to Yorktown. And those were the only two nights he was home. And the reason, I mean, one, this was something he had learned earlier from the the Seven Years' War. He had not done that and had been criticized for it. But No one could question his commitment, and that was a physical demonstration of that commitment. And he, I mean, he felt it. He really did, and and that's pretty remarkable. Okay, let me put in a number 10 uh, from my own list, and I know that Washington picked this on his own. Do you know what the password for that evening's battle was? No. Victory or death. Victory or death. So that was, I mean... Who goes there, you have to say victory or death. Yes, and with that, we need to bring this week's conversation to a close. I I want to thank you both, Clay and Lindsay. It's been a wonderful conversation. And please join us again next week for another edition of The Thomas Jefferson Hour. The Thomas Jefferson Hour is brought to you each week by Dakota Sky Education program is distributed nationally by Prairie Public. President Thomas Jefferson lived from 1743 to 1826, and this program presents his views. President Jefferson is portrayed by the award-winning humanities scholar and author Clay S. Jenkinson. To obtain a copy of this or any show for a $12 donation, please call 701-575-0727. This program is also available online at jeffersonhour.com and on Apple Podcasts.
If you'd like to correspond with President Jefferson or submit a question for him to answer on the program, please visit the website at jeffersonhour.com. The Thomas Jefferson Hour is produced at Makoche Recording Studios in Bismarck, North Dakota. Bach Cello Suite Number no. 3 in C Major by Stephen Swinford. Thank you for listening. Please tune in again next week for another thought-provoking, historically accurate program, Through the Eyes of Thomas Jefferson.